any industry we enter into, I always want to make sure we're the best at it. Whether it takes us one year, 10 years, 20, we will be. We're the only cryptocurrency where we will, you can actually buy something with it. Whatever you're doing, wherever you're streaming, whatever goals you have, you know, put them out, map them down and think big regardless. Yeah, it is very good news. So the, the mechanics of the Bitcoin market right now, there is a, a coin called Tether, which is backed by US dollars. And they're having some issues with their bank. So there's some questions over whether or not uh, you can redeem the Tethers for US dollars at this point. It probably will be resolved. They put out a note saying it'll be resolved by tomorrow, but that caused this big spike in Bitcoin. Um, you know, this news from Fidelity is, on the other side, that's fantastic news. So when are we going to see this institutional money flow in? I mean, because that had been always the mantra. And is this really, is having the custodial services going to be the last barrier to some of these institutions? Yeah. Or is it really the institutional mandate that prevents some of these institutions from, from buying? So it's not so much the institutional mandate anymore. Custody has been a very, very big hurdle. And having somebody like Fidelity put their stamp on it and say, yes, this is a new asset class and we're going to custody this. And I believe they even said they may have some insurance. So that is a step closer. Now you have Yale investing, Yale endowment. This has put everybody on notice, at least in the institutional area. You either have to have a strategy for investing in this or you have to have a reason why you're not. So I would expect over the next three months, six months, you start to see the proverbial herd really start to turn in this direction. And I can just tell you from the conversations we've had for our crypto hedge fund, that herd is starting to enter this market. Yale is a, is a good example, but Yale is not actually investing in cryptocurrencies themselves. They're investing in blockchain-based startups. Isn't that a differentiation that makes it, I mean, when it comes to being a Bitcoin bull, that is a mm -hmm. bullish data point, but that's not helping the currency. Yeah, well, actually, I believe the fund that Yale is investing in is 70% cryptocurrencies, 30% kind of infrastructure plays. Uh, but it is investing in a fund. So, again, we need new buyers. We need fresh capital coming into this place. The relentless selling over this last year has been painful. It appears to me to be done. But we don't have that new buyer yet. So that's why we're all looking for these new avenues of capital coming into so the market. So how long do you think it will be before companies like Schwab, maybe Vanguard, uh, some of the other big players in retail investing get into this game in, in, a, in a significant way? I think very soon. It would not surprise me if a lot of those companies already have something working in the background. Uh, I would probably think it's probably first quarter of 2019. I mean, if you're, if you're looking at this, a couple different things. One, Fidelity's in it. Also, remember, some of the startups, like a Robinhood app, they, they launched uh, crypto and got a million users in four days. So if you're at Schwab or you're at E-Trade and you look at that and say, hey, you know what, where are the customers? They're there. We have to offer this product. So, BK, just to be clear, are you saying that you think it's very close on a number of those firms to be able to offer trading in Bitcoin to a retail investor? Are you talking about still to large hedge, fund, hedge funds and other institutional investors? No, I would, I would expect the your traditional retail, uh, E-Trade, Schwab, those type of um, companies, I would expect uh, beginning a qu quarter one, 2019, that they would offer it to their, to their retail it. investors. Okay. Fidelity could single-handedly solidify crypto as a new asset class. Next on your 4-Minute Crypto Daily News. Hello and welcome to 4-Minute Crypto. Now today's show is from a post by Joseph Young at CCN.com and is brought to you by the Crypto Cousins Podcast. Listen or subscribe to this podcast on your iPhone by going to CryptoCousins.com slash iTunes. And before I start, I do want to remind you to like, subscribe, and please share. Now, Fidelity, the world's fourth largest asset manager, with $7.2 trillion in assets under management, launched its cryptocurrency arm. Fidelity CEO Abigail Johnson said, Our goal is to make digitally native assets such as Bitcoin 
more accessible to investors. According to BKCM's CEO, Brian Kelly, the stamp of approval by fidelity on cryptocurrencies as a new asset class has allowed the market to appeal to institutional investors that include hedge funds, pensions, and endowments. Kelly states one of the world's largest asset managers and investment firms has recognized cryptocurrency as an asset class, and that could lead to a herd of institutional investors in the month to come. Kelly continued, custody has been a very big hurdle, and having someone like Fidelity put their stamp on it and say, yes, this is a new asset class, and we're going to keep custody, is a step closer. Shangpeng Zhao, better known as CZ, he is the CEO of Binance, which is the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the global market. He asked, what happens when a fund like Fidelity allocates a mere 5% of their portfolio to cryptocurrency? Have you calculated how much that is? Well, 5% of $7.2 trillion in assets under management by Fidelity, that's equivalent to $360 billion, which is larger than the valuation of the entire cryptocurrency market. If a major asset manager allocates a small percentage of its portfolio in the cryptocurrency market as a small bet relative to the size of its holdings, then it could trigger many institutional investors to come into the cryptocurrency market. Now, I'm sure that would start a bull run. I'm real sure. So are you ready to see a bull run? I know I am. Let me know your thoughts on Twitter, where I'm at Gary Leland. And don't forget to join me every weekday for a new episode of 4-Minute Crypto. Look at the Weimar Republic, the Germans, and Zimbabwe, and now Venezuela. Every time they've printed money, which we have to print money now, the U.S. does because of the Constitution. It's not going to be pretty. And so I feel for your guys, your age, you know, because you guys are going to not only pay for it, but you're going to have to dig your way out of this one. Yeah, it's uh, one of those things where us as individuals, uh, uh, younger people need to, instead of looking towards pensions, actually look towards assets and look at ways to protect their wealth. And that's another thing I wanted to go into with you is the solutions, because we could talk about problems all day, but there are solutions out there. And I've heard you talk about it uh, several times. I see those Lear commercials on Fox News all the time, uh, where you're talking about uh, gold and silver. And I would like uh, to hear your thoughts on the uh, current gold markets and why you think gold uh, and silver stand out above, obviously, the failure of the fiat system? Well, the, look, I can plug my new book, Fake, coming out if I ever get it published. <laughs> I just keep, more stuff keeps coming up, so I keep changing the book, Fake. And it's going to be uh, for initially free online so people can look at it. But when I was your age, I was 25 years old, that's the, in 72, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard in 71. So in 72, the book fake starts with me flying my helicopter behind enemy lines into Vietnam. So I went to North, it went, uh, not North Vietnam, but the, uh, the North Vietnamese had overrun our position. And so there was a gold mine in enemy hands. So my goofy co-pilot and I and a crew chief, we flew behind enemy lines to go look for gold, <laughs> like idiots. And, and we, so we were in this village that's overrun by Viet Cong and NVA, and we're, hey, hi, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we walked, we, walked, we came out of our helicopters unarmed mm. to let them know we came as business guys, not military guys. Mm. And <clears throat> so I, we tried to buy gold then, and I realized something, <clears throat> I'd never seen gold. Mm. Because back in 72, it was illegal for Americans to own gold. So that same year, we, our ship was an aircraft carrier. We sailed into Hong Kong, and I bought my first gold. I think it was a Krugerrand. It was about 50 bucks. Well, today, that same Krugerrand is worth 1500 and the dollar's worth nothing. So what I always say to young people, you know, is you want to buy what's real money, and gold and silver are God's money. And what, what I mean by God's money is this is that gold and silver were here when the earth was created. You know, the gold, I believe, is 70, atomic number 79, silver is 47. Gold and silver will be here when the cockroaches are dead. You know, and gold and silver will be here long after the dollar and the Canadian dollar and the loonies gone and all this. So I, I've just been buying gold and silver every chance I got since I was your age. And now I have, 
<clears throat> now it's a big problem called storage. And I don't keep anything in banks, you know I mean? I've had to fly my gold and silver to what I say safe countries. That and, and not because I don't, not because of the country, is America so litigious that if I get sued, then and if I lose my lawsuit, the SOB that wins the lawsuit has to go look for my money in some other country, which is expensive. So I've hid my gold and silver outside the U.S. in very safe places with long trails. But that's because it's, it'll still be here when the cockroaches are dead, you know? So, and the more they print money, which they probably will, the more valuable gold and silver gets. gets. It's not that gold and silver goes up in price. It's the value in my country of the dollar going up and down. So if the dollar goes up, price of gold comes down. Dollar comes down, gold goes up. So that's why I say gold and silver are real money. And so I've been telling everybody for years, you know, like when you, if you have no money, start with silver. You know, 20 bucks for a silver coin. You know, Canadian uh, silver, silver leaf, whatever you call them, yeah. But I would save that. I wouldn't save the loony, and I wouldn't save the dollar, and I wouldn't save the yen or the yuan. So to me, that makes more sense. Yeah. What good is keeping a whole bunch of paper under your mattress when all you can use it for is, you know, fire fodder and wallpaper, as they've seen in the past? And, you know, it's not such a bad problem to have to not know where to store all your gold. That's, that's a good problem to have. But all the same, it is a very real problem. You've got to see kind of a monetary revolution to change the tides. And uh, I think it seems like something's happening soon. Now, we've all been probably, I assume all of us have been hurt uh, significantly in the cryptocurrency markets in recent uh, months. But that's not to say that, obviously, the blockchain technology, of, when decentralized, has a lot of great potential uh, going forward. Obviously, it's just in its infancy. Um, what do you think about uh, the future of uh, cryptocurrency. Crypto assets commonly include cryptocurrencies, blockchain companies, cryptocurrency funds, and initial coin offerings, ICOs. Crypto assets are a hot topic in the investment world. Not all of them are regulated as securities, but all have risks investors should consider. They are promoted to investors as industry game changers. Whether it's getting in early with a startup via an ICO, trading cryptocurrencies, investing in new companies trying to capitalize on blockchain, or investing in multiple cryptocurrencies via a cryptocurrency fund, investors who hope to profit should be aware of the risks that come along with it. Crypto assets are still fairly new types of investments with minimal track records. Sometimes it is very difficult for investors to truly assess the business value behind a cryptocurrency, ICO, cryptocurrency fund, and blockchain company. Seek qualified professional advice to help you make an informed decision. Scams have emerged that take advantage of the virtual nature of crypto assets, the lack of investor protection, and the hype. To help you address these risks and avoid scams, you should always step back from the hype to get a more realistic view of what the crypto asset is meant to do. Always do your homework. Research the basis of the asset's value and what factors might cause it to change. Understand the business and risks of the particular crypto asset. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. Well, in my book, Fake, I wrote, today there's three types. There's been different types of money through different times of years, like centuries. Like cattle was one of the original money. That's why it's called collateral, you know, when they that, and they have in kind which was uh, kinder, you know, that if you, if, you, if you stored your cattle with a um, lender, they got the kinder in kind. They got the babies. That's called interest today. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's been gone for a long time. So those three types of money today are, you know, God's money, gold and silver. Then you have government money, which is fiat currency, the dollar, the loony, the yen, the yuan. And then you have people's money, which is crypto, mm -hmm. and it's really blockchain. But I, I agree with you, it's just in the infancy right now. Mm -hmm. And this guy Warren Buffett and his friend Charlie Munger, mm -hmm. they call it cryptocurrency rat droppings. Well, those are the same guys, I mean, they're smart guys, but they also didn't invest in Amazon or Apple either. Mm -hmm. And now they're backing, they're, now they're loading up on Amazon and Apple, so they're calling crypto rat droppings at the same time 
Singapore, which is a very sophisticated, you know, well-run island nation, they have uh, Bitcoin bonds and all this stuff by the government. So I, I think when I look at crypto, I've got to be talking to the people that know what they're talking about, not a bunch of old guys like me, you know, that's a waste of time. But the thing I, I'm kind of interested about crypto is that the guys your age are mining them, you know? And the reason I think that's interesting is that because I, I, I've listed three companies on Toronto, I mean, Toronto and Vancouver stock exchanges. And I was a miner. I started a silver mine, a gold mine. And now your generation is starting Bitcoin mines or crypto mines, you know? <laughs> and it's gonna alter the world forever, you know, in a few years. Yeah, uh, it's pretty incredible what cryptocurrencies are at. Uh, the potential there is uh, unbelievable. Uh, however, obviously, we've seen a uh, recent bubble burst. And uh, obviously, you look back at the dot-com bubble and you see Amazon and you see Pets.com. Well, Pets.com didn't have fundamental value there, but Amazon did and they had potential. And Amazon built on that potential and after a while, they came back and now they're stronger than ever. Uh, whether you agree with Amazon's politics or not, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is they bounced back from a bubble because they had fundamental value. There's a lot of cryptocurrencies at the same time that have no fundamental value and they're ridiculous to invest in, just, you know, they're scams. But then there's a lot of great cryptocurrencies out there that are trying to innovate. And this is kind of like a free market, the first real currency free market we've seen. And obviously we're going to see the government attempt to manipulate the markets much like they have. I think it's a wonderful time to buy Bitcoin. You can actually buy a fraction of a Bitcoin so you don't have to go in and buy ten, uh, you know, ten thousand plus dollars on a whole coin, um, but you can actually just buy a hundred dollars, fifty dollars worth of a bitcoin. It'd be a great stocking stuffer. So, do you try, Eric, to to figure out what it should be worth? Do you have any sense that holy cow, this thing's up so much, I'm just going to cash it in and sit on my gains here, or do you think, as we've heard some people say, it could go to a hundred thousand dollars or a million? I mean, I think cryptocurrency and thus Bitcoin is really the future of, of the financial system and the future of currency. So uh, I try to avoid taking as much out uh, as I can. Um, I, I really don't want to do that. I, whenever I uh, sell a little bit of Bitcoin um, or pay for something in Bitcoin, I multiply that price by 10 because that's where I think that Bitcoin's going. And I think it's going to be huge and I think it's going to be incredible. So I try not to take out um, any, any. I try to really avoid that. So you made this bet with your parents that if you were 18 and a millionaire, they, they wouldn't force you to go to college, right? Which turned out pretty well. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, as it sounds, yeah. But, it but what happens if, if this thing now craters, goes to zero, what the case may be, what is your fallback plan now? I mean, I'm heavily diversified in other cryptocurrencies. I'm diversified outside of cryptocurrencies, but I really do have a lot betting on Bitcoin because I, I really do firmly, Bitcoin, like Bitcoin to me, it's not just an investment. Um, it's not just a maybe a get rich quick scheme as a lot of people put it, but I see it as the future of currency. I see it as the future of the financial system. So I think it's, it's that, that's where it is. And I think it, the icing on the cake is that it's a great investment. So I think that's what it's really backed by. And that's what I have a lot of faith and belief in. Eric, it's uh, Evan and uh I guess congratulations for making a lot of money from for, for seeing something Thank or you. investing uh, quite early in the cycle. What if tomorrow every government in the world viewed cryptocurrencies as a threat to actually their own currency and just outlawed them? What asset? If, if I mean, you that's were, if, if they if they said to you, Eric, that's fine. But next time we catch you trading your Bitcoin, we're going to put you in jail. Not not that I think that is exactly the way it would happen. What value would the cryptocurrency then have in your mind? So, yeah, I mean, this has happened before um, with uh, uh, there was like Liberty Dollars or Liberty Coins in 2006 and a guy created his own currency and he was prosecuted uh, for that. But that's why Bitcoin was so amazing and Bitcoin is so incredible when it came out and why I saw it as more than just another currency because people have tried to create their own currencies and they end up getting banned before is the technology that Bitcoin is built off of. It ex the blockchain technology that Bitcoin is built off of means that it's controlled by no one, 
you can't shut down anyone, and uh, it can exist even if every government in the world banned it. So obviously, I think the price would go down if every government in the world banned it, which is unrealistic, but I understand just for, uh, just for the situation, and it is a possibility for sure. But I mean, the beauty of the technology is that it can, it can exist purely if every government in the world banned it and even thrive. As you see in China, they banned a lot of stuff like that, a lot of uh, banned the Bitcoin exchanges and all that. And Bitcoin is still actually being used in China. And that's what's so beautiful about Bitcoin and the technology itself. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching. Hello, my name is Charlie Morris and welcome to Atlas Pulse TV. Today in the studio I'm joined by Danny Masters, who's the chairman and founder of Global Advisors. Welcome Danny. Thank you Charlie, nice to be here. So for a living I gather you have something to do with Bitcoin, is that right? It's a passion. It's a passion. And what got you started? Why, why do you believe in Bitcoin so much? Uh, as a career-long commodities trader in oil and gas and precious metals, um, I saw a really you know, long cycle um, uh, in the commodities space that really came to an end in, in 2010. Uh, prices for commodities has gone up a thousand percent over the decade or so prior to that. And, um, and the market had reached an appropriate level where I, I believe that you know, supply and demand were going to be in a closer balance for a long time. So I was looking for something new and uh, the volatility of Bitcoin was what caught my attention. Uh, and then the interesting nature of the technical structure around it, uh, the blockchain technology as it's well known as, as now, uh, and also the very nature of money itself comes into question, and those are the things that interested me. So back in 2011, I discovered Bitcoin, although I did nothing about it. My, uh, a, a hippie friend of mine, who's also an economist by the name of Thomas Patterson, said, you have to look at this new electronic gold called Bitcoin. And um, of course, I dismissed it because I assumed you could just cut and paste bitcoins. You can't store, um, you know, digit you, can't, you can't store code on your computer and call that money. But as you say, the blockchain was the big game changer, wasn't it? And it wasn't until 2013 that I certainly discovered um, blockchain, and it was it was a life changing a moment. Mm. And the same happened for you. Yes, I I think um, a globally distributed, time stamped, synchronous peer to peer uh, ledger. Uh, is, is a strange concept for people. Um, this was the genius of Satoshi, Nakam Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto, the, uh, the founder of Bitcoin. Um, he enabled uh, the trustless transaction uh, of a financial a, a trade across the internet between two people who don't know or trust each other. Uh, and that, that idea has what, is what's powered uh, the whole blockchain revolution. So in a nutshell, it's just the exchange of value across the internet, isn't it? And a whole new asset class has been born, hasn't it? I think that I think the term transactional layer of the internet is a very good one. The internet's not designed to do financial transactions; it's designed to send data. So you need to do something extra uh, in order to to secure financial transactions. Obviously, we do financial transactions with our credit cards on the internet, and that's very common. Uh, but that's not a native deployment uh, of a payment, and a Bitcoin transaction is. So we've just taken a, the, the old school banking system, called it PayPal made it secure on the internet, and that's a kind of interim stage for what lies ahead, isn't it? I call it lipstick on a pig, to be <laughs> perfectly honest. The, um, uh, I've always thought that what was going to happen was that rather than there being some ideological struggle, battle and subsequent victory uh, in uh, between legacy fiat currency systems and Bitcoin, that what would happen is we would see a very diverse payments ecosystem develop, which includes dollars, yen, sterling, and, and, and pounds, just in the, and, and there's other currencies, the major currencies uh, that we've all know, known and loved, but would also include up, upgrades on that system, that's your PayPal and your Apple Pay, would also include Bitcoin, um, and would also include a number of other uh, digital payment mechanisms, giving you a very broad ecosystem where analogous to your phone where you may have six travel apps, you know, you may have six payment apps, and you may have apps that actually work in the background where you're making payments you don't even know you're making or not consciously acting. But on. a bit of authorising someone. Authorising them, yeah. No, sure. so, so, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's the vision. And, and you know, the, the, the thesis behind Bitcoin is, is nothing to do with does it replace the dollar. That's always a very contentious debate. The question is how much of the M1 money supply or the payments network or the value of gold 
or the dark web or the black market? Um, you know, how, 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 how much penetration uh, and what share does Bitcoin end up with? And because it is so small in relation to those other components, that's what gives it a lot of upside. Because right now only a billion dollars a day changes hands, which is obviously up from um, zero in 2009 and 10 million in 2011 and so on. So, uh, and as, the, and as the, the utility of the network has grown, so the price has, 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 has grown very rapidly as well. We're talking $4,000 Bitcoin today, aren't we? And um, on, on a billion dollar of transaction. And, and you know, can you imagine a million dollar Bitcoin? Is it possible? I, I made the price forecast of the levels we're currently at, um, probably somewhat fortunately a couple of years ago. Um, I do see a lot of very high price forecasts for Bitcoin. I also see some very low ones. Um, so, you know, I do think that there is um, significant more upside and I take your point and I concur that the transactional volume on the blockchain on a day-to-day -day basis is strongly correlated to the value. We can see that across multiple digital asset networks. Um, what I think is really important is in recent months, and I think this has been the real-time catalyst, um, a, a mechanism by which we can scale the Bitcoin network, the blockchain, uh, has sort of come into formation. This was a very contentious issue for a long time, held the market back. We've just doubled the capacity of the blockchain uh, in, in recent days. Um, but more importantly, I believe that that's laid a framework by which we can make subsequent upgrades as well. If you can upgrade the blockchain, which was the, uh, the, the, the choke point, uh, then you can do a lot more transactions, and I think that's what we'll see. Because essentially, before the scaling happened, because some, some viewers may not understand this, but, but basically the Bitcoin network had reached capacity. It was a bit like having a, um, a restaurant with a queue outside and not enough meals to feed them all, but there was huge demand to use the network. And now we've had the size of the network, it can continue to grow. That's correct. Um, you know, Bitcoin's capacity to um, print individual transactions is surprisingly limited. The one megabyte block size that each block that was created every 10 minutes roughly across the blockchain translates into about seven transactions a second. Now, the Visa network can do thousands of transactions a second. Uh, with this recent upgrade, you know, we can probably now do 14 or 20 transactions a second. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's where we are in terms of the relative, you know, usability of these networks. Um, but the path forward for Bitcoin, I think now is open to see uh, that scaling. Now, you, you would, we were talking about currencies earlier, and um, there's obviously this, this terrible term cryptocurrency, which I, I think is misleading, and digital asset is probably a, 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 um, a, better, a better way to describe this space, because this is a new asset class. There's no correlation with currency. There's no correlation with commodity, with equities, with property, um, or, or, or with the bond market. And that makes it hugely, hugely um, beneficial to portfolio managers today. Now, your company, uh, Global Advisors, has Bitcoin products, doesn't it? Yes, we do. Could you tell me a little bit about those? Yes. Um, to your first point, um, I've always been very mindful of, of, of correlation. Uh, people tend to focus on performance, but correlation is hugely important. If you're doing an efficient, creating an efficient frontier of, of assets in a sort of Markowitz portfolio, uh, you know, your goal is to uh, find the, the highest risk-adjusted return you can find, and correlation plays a very strong part in that. So not only has Bitcoin been one of the most prolifically uh, performing assets of all kind, it has done it with no correlation to any other asset class, and that makes it very special. Um, the market, I, wouldn't, I don't think the market has been mature enough to really think about portfolio allocation and including digital assets in it to date, but that is now happening and we're seeing uh, institutional people start to look at it and when they plug the five-year performance of Bitcoin into a portfolio, um, it has some pretty powerful positive effects. Um, our firm, um, going on to Global Advisors, um, we have a, a growing suite of products we have uh, our flagship fund, Gabby, which is a actively managed Bitcoin-only fund. Uh, we recently launched um, a CoinShares uh, Fund 1 LP, which is a private fund, closed-ended fund, investing in uh, protocol coins such as Ethereum. Um, and so that's the rest of the space, because the space is worth $130 billion. Yeah. Bitcoin's a little, little over half of that, right. and the rest of it's a whole lot of exciting new stuff. That's right, and that's what the second fund focuses on, very much a very, very frontier market. Um, so that's, uh, that's the second uh, uh, current, current leg of the strategy, and the third 
is uh, we have uh, two um, NASDAQ listed Bitcoin tracking certificates that mirror the price of Bitcoin almost perfectly. And they've proved hugely popular. And the reason is that they're so easily accessible. Bitcoin markets are not easily accessible to people, at least in the sense but, that they... But for, your for, for Danny, for your tracker products, I've got to go to Sweden for some reason. Why is that? The product is listed on the Swedish NASDAQ, um, NASDAQ OMX. Uh, and, and NASDAQ, um, and particularly in Scandinavia, have been the most proactive regulated exchange uh, for digital assets. So we're going to see Bitcoin and other digital asset products across other exchanges. But Sweden just had a first move uh, in that space. That being said, um, our product is accessible, for example, on an electronic platform like Interactive Brokers. Interactive Brokers is available in 179 countries around the world. Anyone with that platform can access that NASDAQ market and buy that tracker. So the Swedes, the Swedes really have been, or well, the Scandinavians in general, always pretty adventurous, aren't they, at these sorts of things? Mm -hmm. So well done to them. But I think what, what's, what's changed is, you know, three years ago you launched your fund. You struggled to raise money for a long time. Yep. Now, now, you know, it's very hard to get hold of you because you're the most popular, busiest man in the world. You told me you haven't been sleeping for good reasons because business is so good. So, but, but this is now because institutional money is coming into the space. You know, Bitcoin started off with um, um, computer people who, who, who saw a sort of geeky crypto, um, cryptographic project, then the, um, you know, the naughty people, the bad actors that we call them, or the libertarians got excited, then the speculators like us got involved, um, and now the institutional money is coming. Tell me, what's the difference in the conversation you're having with a, um, a, a typical fund manager today uh, compared to the conversation you're having three years ago? In some cases, um, what is surprising uh, and some, to some of the larger institutions that are now engaging with us um, there is no longer a conversation about what is Bitcoin. So they're no, they're no longer asking, the, you know, what is it, how does it work, why is it? What is it backed by? No. Those kind of so questions. So that question's gone. They're gone. They're gone. Uh, at the moment, um, the engagements we're having are uh, primarily in the structure of the products we have, um, the regulatory framework in which we operate these various products, the saleability of those products into different jurisdictions, obviously due diligence on us and our firm, um, considerations about liquidity. Um, so it's really an execution style inquiry, not a research style inquiry. And, and that's, that's been very surprising so to me. So they actually know they want it? Yes. And, you know, for somebody that has had a passion for this asset class for a long time and had innumerable conversations, um, you know, rebuffed by it's a Ponzi scheme, it's not backed by anything, um, it's surprising to me that those conversations have simply vanished. And it can't be a Ponzi scheme because a Ponzi scheme is a fraud and this is not a fraud, it's a beautiful piece of technology. And it can't be a pyramid scheme because in a pyramid scheme some, some um, ladders, if you like, or, or, or networks are very valuable and others are worthless. And in this case all Bitcoins are worth the same, so therefore it can't be a pyramid scheme. It's maybe just a bit of a mania. But mania is a good, Well, right? it's interesting you should say that. Um, a friend of mine uh, sent me an article about manias and it focused on the California gold rush and the tulip mania. And what was interesting in both cases was they spawned, respectively, Levi jeans and very enduring brands, possibly the town of San Francisco as well. Uh, and it's arguable, arguable the Netherlands wouldn't exist uh, were, had it not been uh, for the tulip bubble. So, you know, I think... Uh, Obviously, well, what you're saying is bubbles are good, and they are. Well, they're, cre they're creative processes. Absolutely. And, and that's what we're seeing. Um, if you think about the remarkable um, use cases we found for the Internet, things like Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, and so on, things that weren't conceivable, even when the Internet was you know, reasonably well adopted, genius ideas that enabled new use cases were using this platform, the Internet. And I think now what we're seeing, yeah, what we, what the, the unknown unknown is what are the genius use cases for digital assets? And there are some really interesting uh, some, uh, possibilities. The 10 year vision is a tough one, though, isn't it? You know, if you say, what's the Internet like um, in, 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 in 2027 versus you know, with or without this technology? Mm. Uh, what is the difference? There must be a difference. But have you, have you, have you any good visions for that or ideas of where we go? I, I think we're going to see um, certainly, you know, directly in the financial space. Um, you know, our vision now has broadened out from the products that we mentioned and the idea we had about Bitcoin as a commodity to the concept of a digital investment bank. Uh, and I do think that uh, across many, many areas, the programmable nature of money as represented by Bitcoin 
uh, the programmable nature of capital as represented by Ethereum. Um, these are going to throw up some remarkable opportunities going forward, but I don't think anybody really can understand what they are just yet. No, sure. So I just want to talk about the asset, you know, fundraising. You know, we've obviously touched on the conversations changed. People accept Bitcoin, they get it, it's going up. They haven't got it, they wish they did. Um, and so it's now all about due diligence and all the sort of um, the sensible conversation. Um, you know, how has your asset journey evolved over the last few years? Well, we, for, my, 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 my thoughts early on were that given the controversial nature of Bitcoin, as I approached it in 20, 2013, um, it required a really robust framework. And so we approached our regulators in Jersey, and after 18 months, um, we got the approval to create what is still the world's first regulated Bitcoin investment fund. Um, so that was that was kind of a really big a, a really big deal. And I think um, you know going forward, we're going to see. Uh, we, we see the Chicago Board of Options, Chicago Board of Options, uh, CBOE, uh, just launching their, or trying to launch their futures contract. We've seen a failed attempt uh, of a Bitcoin ETF in the States, but that may come back. Uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange have now got their, their Bitcoin reference rate that they're going to plan a futures contract on as well. You know, it's, it's, it's a dramatic change over, over, those, over those years in terms of how much uh, regulatory freedom there is now to, to do this stuff. So the message to the audience is, Bitcoin is here to stay, Institu institutional money is coming, and it's a very exciting long-term journey. Yeah, no, I think so. I think it's, um, um, you know, who knows um, how long this second phase will last. Um, but I do believe um, that the, the powering of digital assets uh, is sort of rooted in the capital that, that comes into it. That's what funds developers, that's what interests retail vendors to adopt different payment technologies. That's what you know, makes corporations start to incorporate digital asset technologies into their their day-to-day -day work. And, and so, yeah, that's, 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 that's kind of the vision for the 10, year, ten years forward. And uh, when do you think your firm's going to cross a billion dollars under management? Um, well, you know, back to your, your, your earlier point, you know, that, that fund 18 months in creation, uh, you know, struggled along with five million in assets probably for two or three years. Uh, we, when we got involved in the Swedish market in the Bitcoin tracker, that jumped up to maybe 20. Uh, in the last six months, we've passed 250 million, and I'm confident uh, within 12 months we'll be over a billion. Fantastic. Well, well done. Thank you. And um, and, and you, you know, when you buy your new boat, when you get to a billion of assets, what are you going to call it? Well, I have to call it the Atlas, Charlie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Danny, thank you very much for joining me, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Look out for the next episode of Atlas Pulse TV. Cryptocurrency billionaire wants to build an experimental city in Nevada that would be half the size of Prague. And he wants it to run completely on blockchain technology. RT's Trinity Chavez joins us live to talk more about this innovative idea. Trinity, tell us more about this project. Who exactly is behind it? 
Well, his name is Jeffrey Burns, and he's the owner of Blockchains LLC, and he bought a massive plot of land in the middle of the desert for $170 million, all in cash. He plans to create an experimental community that'll span over 100 square miles. That's roughly the size of Reno. The governor of Nevada is calling this project Innovation Park. It will include homes, schools, commercial districts, production studios, an office park, and will even have an e-gaming area. The project will be developed into a smart city. It will incorporate the blockchain technologies into all of the infrastructure, including AI technology, nanotechnology, residential units, and of course, various financials. The city will also have autonomous vehicles, and they're about, a, and all of them will be 100% electric. Burns says that he really wants to enhance the human experience. Well, that's a pretty lofty project. What exactly is the purpose of creating a city like this? Well, this is a chance to showcase how business development, residential living, and commerce can grow alongside one another in a world of changing technologies. This so-called city will essentially be a series of projects taking place to highlight the power of the public blo blockchain. The blockchain began as a digital ledger where all Bitcoin transactions are recorded. Some believe that it could be a new way of taking back power from institutions that they believe are calling all the shots. And this is just, uh, just as Bitcoin made it possible to transfer money without using a bank, blockchain believers like Burns thinks that this technology will make it possible for ordinary people to control their own data without relying on big companies or governments, keeping all the systems honest, fair, and democratic. This certainly isn't the first group or individual who said they want to invest in the future of Bitcoin, but why Nevada specifically? This, this project seems like something we'd see in some you know, place like Silicon Valley. Well, yeah, but Burns was drawn to the state because of its tax benefits, including the lack of income taxes. He is spending his own money. He's already spent around $300 million so far and plans to staff about 70 employees. He also promised to relinquish 90% of the dividends to residents, employees, and investors. And so far, it seems that officials are eager for the development to start. This could really have a positive impact on the whole community. Burns said that the company won't begin construction on the broader property until late 2019. So this is definitely something that we should keep our eyes on, Anya. We will be keeping our eyes on it, and we'll make sure to bring you back on to talk about it as we learn more. RT correspondent Trinity Chavez, thanks a lot. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for checking out our channel. We hope you enjoyed the video. We have tons of content for you just like this. For more of RT America's one-of-a-kind news and analysis, be sure to subscribe and never stop questioning more. Kyle, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Hmm. <laughs> You're hitting me with a bunch of hard questions here. Um, you know, good. Bitcoin, early on, I summarily dismissed Bitcoin, and, uh, and I shouldn't have. Um, I didn't understand, truthfully, I don't understand uh, the depth of the, the algorithms, the technology, and the, the, the fundamental foundation of Bitcoin I didn't understand. I spent a lot of time trying to understand it in the last, call it, six months. And I believe that, that the digital asset class of cryptocurrency is a real asset class. But in terms of kind of how the world views digital currencies, you know, we, we talk, when you look at, at global cash positions today, given global QE, they're now north of 110% of global GDP. So we're talking about almost $100 trillion worth of cash in the world. That has never happened before in world history. And so when I think about uh, inflation, you're starting to see wages move. You're starting to see the price of all goods and services move. The thing that's been really deflationary in the globe has been technology. It's been a, a very positive deflationary force. And I think that's kind of, pl that's played out. The technological deflation has played out. So now I think you're going to start to see inflation and wages move. And this gets into cryptocurrency. The collective value of cryptocurrency is a little over $100 billion today. Right, global M2, global cash, it's like 80 trillion, 100 trillion dollars. So what's 100 billion dollars? You know, the question is, what's it worth? And as a store value, a medium exchange, and other currency, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any true institutional investor has any money in Bitcoin. I know some have a little bit. Uh, you know, they have nominal amounts invested, but I think it will be an asset class that will work over time. I'm not sure how to value it yet. I really have no idea. Do you own it? Uh, I don't. No Bitcoin, no Ether. I don't. Are I mean, you tempted? I, I, I say I wish I did, 
But I think there's well, a digital. Well, because you could have bought a lot lower. I think there's a digital gold rush that's gone on. I think a whole bunch of people are going to lose a lot of money, right? That, these ICOs, you're going to see a bunch of them go completely broke. There are, a bunch of them are frauds. And um, that's going to be problematic for all the people that just rushed in. Uh, and, and so I, I feel like it's a bit of a mania at the moment. But I think in the long term, it's a viable asset class. So at what point do you get in? Well, I'll let you know when I do. <laughs> I think that uh, you know you can look at some of these things if you look at something like Ether, which is the the commodity asset that powers the Ethereum network. That is a very commodity-like asset. It is it, you can think of it much more like oil. It is consumed in order to run uh, secure code on this network, and so um, you know that would as demand grows for that form of fuel. Uh, and they call it gas, uh, actually, uh, that you have to pay. But as demand grows for that kind of fuel, then absolutely you'd see price correlation of the demand for apps that are, uh, that are built on top of that. But to the correlation issue, I think one of the really noteworthy things has been how correlated so many of the crypto assets have been. If you look at the charts, you can see that really, really clearly. And that's completely irrational. Um, so c clearly, uh, these are not all created equal, not even remotely close. I, I share a lot of Barry's sentiment that you know, probably 90% of the projects are, are not long-term. Um, 99. I mean, really, I mean, <laughs> look, a, I mean, a lot, but I, I think what you will see now, and I think we're gonna see this really in the very near future is projects that raise capital and are launching, you're gonna be able to value them on the basis of the utility they're providing and the, and the adoption. And there are some really interesting funds out there that have built valuation methodologies around crypto assets, and I think that's worth looking at those, but you will see uh, these become less correlated uh, as we go into the second half of this year. So if I'm an institutional investor, why should I invest now? It sounds like there is still so much to be found out about which uh, cryptocurrencies are going to be the cryptocurrencies. I mean, you've got your five, but there are probably people out there who even doubt that there are five right now. Sure. Why not wait till more projects are being built on these platforms to really see which ones will will dominate at the end of the day? Well, I think as look as an asset class, it's here to stay. Um, and why? Why, um, why? why do we take that for granted? That as an asset class, it's here to stay. Yes. Yeah, so w one, I think look the the amount of innovation and investment and enthusiasm and awareness that now exists in a, such a, a very short period of time, um, uh, I'm 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 a hundred percent confident that a you know decentralized non-fiat non-government company controlled form of money is here to stay um, is bitcoin the winner i don't know so i think for most investors that i speak with especially institutional investors who are now really starting to get involved um, in this asset class they don't have an answer to that question. And so one of the ways that they're starting to play the space is via index type vehicles. Uh, one of our companies is Grayscale Investments, which is the largest asset manager in the space. And the most recent fund that we launched is a, is a digital large cap fund that invests across the top five and rebalances quarterly. So the bet there is this asset class is here to stay. I don't know what the winner is gonna be, but I have money deployed in the space. Yeah, I mean, just to add a little bit to that, so we, we also have a product called Circle Invest, which is a retail product, and you can, with a couple taps, buy the market across market cap adjusted across seven of the major assets, and that will grow to support a number of other assets. But to the, to the why is it here to stay, I mean, I think what people are missing is that this is a new infrastructure layer of the internet. The last infrastructure, major infrastructure layers of the internet were you know, built over the last you know, 20 years, but really in, in origin, the 10 years, uh, you know, 10 years earlier, and uh, blockchain technology, these public infrastructures, are a major new infrastructure layer of the internet. It is going to replace what we think of as what operating systems do and the technology that powers everything from communications to trusted transactions. So this is, if, if you're interested in investing in the future of the internet and the infrastructure of the internet, this is probably the most interesting, valuable place to invest. And, a lot, and, and it's sort of like if you could go back 20 years and say, what if I could have made an investment in HTTP, the protocol, and, and the adoption of that? Or what if I could have made an investment in, in you know, voice over IP or one of these kind of protocol layers? That's what you're able to do here. You're able to invest in the infrastructure build out of the next generation of the internet. This isn't just about digital gold. This is about replacing how information works in society. And it's a major, uh, a major breakthrough. I told you before the break, Bitcoin has grown from the $1,000 at the beginning of this year to, to about 15,000 US dollars now. So just in October, one Bitcoin cost around 60,000 Rand. It now hovers around, listen to this, 200 
and 50,000 rand. Now, similar to markets, the Bitcoin response to developments and the, the recent surge in, is speculated to be due to the announcement by two global markets that have announced their intention to legitimize it as an asset class for mainstream investors. What does that all mean? I don't know. What, we've got somebody in studio who's going to help us. Uh, Mpo Degada, he is the author of How I Became a Millionaire at 21, Bitcoin is here in studio with us. Good to have you. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so, so you're a millionaire. <laughs> cryptocurrency millionaire, A yes. cryptocurrency millionaire. Definitely. But does that translate into being a millionaire? It does. Yeah. It does. What is cryptocurrency? So basically what we're looking at, we're looking at currency with specific encryption techniques that do two things. The first thing is they actually verify that you actually have got the currency. And the second thing they do is they help facilitate the transfer between two people and they help encrypt it, meaning no one can hack you, um, no one can duplicate the, the, the method of payment that you're using. So it's basically an encrypted currency. A safer digital currency. Yeah. So you, I mean, you tw you're 23 years old. Yeah. Now. So you, f you first sort of bought into to Bitcoin at around, what were you, you 21 at the time? 20 yeah, 2021, yeah. 2021 at the time. And you got it while it was still sort of on the rise. I did, yeah. What did you buy it? How, what made you interested in Bitcoin? So what happened is somebody asked me to buy them Bitcoin and um, I bought it and overnight the price jumped. So I did my research as to what's actually going on here. Started studying it, started looking at materials involved in it, started looking at blogs where people speak about it. And I mean, what, what interested me most was the technology behind it. Now, Bitcoin is run through blockchain technology and when you look at blockchain technology it's sort of like the future of all transactions it's a piece of technology which allows everyone to see transactions happening out on board yeah. so for example things like corruption are stopped through blockchain because everything is visible to everyone your your blockchain cannot be hacked because the transactions are actually linked to each transaction that has ever happened so it's those sort of attributes that that interested me the, the technology behind it the speed behind it we're looking at the future of currency. Yeah. Um, and that's how I got interested and so interest has grown. Now, the, the one thing is people think, okay, so there's no way I can afford one Bitcoin. I mean, when we're talking, I, I quoted a price of 250,000 Rand. Is that about right? Yeah, that's For about one right. Bitcoin. For one Bitcoin, yeah. But if you don't buy one Bitcoin, you buy... Uh, portions of a Bitcoin. Definitely, yeah. So how, how does that work? I mean, just explain this to me. So basically, when we think about cryptocurrencies, we're not only talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the most valued one. I mean, we have a cryptocurrency like Ripple, which is three rand, four rand for one Ripple. But when we buy Bitcoin, you don't buy, you don't have to buy a complete Bitcoin. You can buy 0 0.1 of a Bitcoin. Okay. So you can buy a specific portion of a Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. And now does it, what does that mean to me? So I own 0 0.1 of a Bitcoin. So what? What, what? what then? What? You've got to help me out here because I think a lot of people are very confused by how this works. So I decide today that I get off here, I want to go and buy Bitcoin and invest in it. So is it an investment or is it pretty much so now I use this as, a, as internet currency, I can buy things for it? Well, you definitely can transact using it. In South Africa, I mean, takealot.com, pick and pay, they've yeah, got a I've trial system. This. So they accept Bitcoin as a method of payment. Okay. You can even get a card to use your Bitcoin. So you can swipe your Bitcoin or swipe your card and then the, 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 the transaction will happen through Bitcoin. So you can do that. Or you can look at just holding it and assessing the value to say, I back this technology. And because of this technology that's involved in, because I see it as a future, I'll just hold it. Yeah. Sort of like gold. So it plays both as dual a currency. And at the same time, it plays both as a technological advancement that's happening that people look at and say, look, I'm seeing value in this. Yeah. A lot of people also see it as a potential bubble and something that could burst very, very soon because I think some people are very, very nervous. Even though um, cryptocurrencies, we, we're talking of a, perhaps a combined value of around about four billion dollars. I mean, that's, that's larger than the GDP of, of, a, of a lot of countries. <laughs> um, but some people say that there is no backing. Um, where do we go? How do you allay fears and say there is a future in Bitcoin or in cryptocurrencies? You know what it is? When, when Bitcoins were actually started, when cryptocurrencies actually started, people were saying, we want to create something that will be driven by demand and supply of the people that are involved and not by a specific political power. Mm. 
So people are trying to move away from your funds sitting with, for example, the Zimbabwean dollar, sitting with the government and the political situation happening, and that values what your currency is worth. So now they wanted to move over to something that's less decentralized, that's affected by demand and supply for the people who are within the actual space. Yeah. So that's what they looked at, the demand and supply within the people in the actual community. So it becomes a global market instead of a country uh, governed market. And that's why we say it's decentralized and it's global because anyone in any country can participate in Bitcoin. Yeah. So that's what people are looking at. And it's, it's driven by demand and supply. And I mean, in an economy, you want the instruments of demand and supply to play their role. Where the demand is high, where the demand is low, where the supply is high or low, you want those instruments to play out and you want it to be fairly governed by the people involved in the system. Okay. And that's what Bitcoin offers people. Yeah. A system where people are involved and they get to make a choice through their decision to say, look, I want to be in or not. If you invest in Bitcoin, so now as you have done, so give us your lesson. So you decided that you were going to go this route, the cryptocurrency route. You were going to invest in, obviously, there's about 900 cryptocurrencies. We keep on emphasizing Bitcoin because, as you yourself have said, it's probably the most valuable and, and well-known at this stage. Um, but if I want to start, what is a good way to begin? All right. Um, well, I'd, I'd say you, the first thing you need to do, I've got a website called www.investinfuturecurrency.com. Mm -hmm. And under that website, there's a tab there called Coin Market Cap. Yeah. And what that gives you, that gives you information on all the altcoins that are available. Now, when you go about investing in cryptocurrencies, you look at what type of solution is this specific cryptocurrency solving. Because different cryptocurrencies are made to solve different solutions. You look at the market cap, you look at what, what are the future advances for it, and you take it from there. There's a coin developed by one of the guys who actually helped develop Google. So he branched away from Google and he started a coin called Litecoin. And now he's looking at partnerships with other retailers. So you'd look at a coin at that and say, do I see value in this? If this guy's involved in Google and this is his plan and this is how the coin is being developed, you assess that situation and then you go forth and you do investment based on that. Litecoin, as we speak, um, last week it was about 1,300. And because of the potential partnerships that it's got lined up, Microsoft is one of the people that are saying, look, we're going ahead and we're investing in this cryptocurrency. Today it's at around 4,000 wow. because of the value of technology. So I always say cryptocurrencies are likened to the digital age of currency. You've got something that's coming on board, that's solving solutions that we've had for so many years. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it and you say, is this actually solving the solution that I want? And that's how people are thinking about it, as something of a solution. I once spoke in Zimbabwe, and when I got there, I was so surprised. There's a petrol station in Zim that only accepts Bitcoin. Wow. So they say, we're not accepting anything else. We also, we're only accepting Bitcoin. And they buy their petrol to Bitcoin. So in a country where it seems like their currency has failed, Bitcoin comes in as a solution. So it's those technological advances that are causing people to say, look, we want to know what this is and we want to see, can we actually use it as a solution? Dubai has now got a minister of blockchain, which is essentially a minister of Bitcoin. Yeah. So even governments are looking so at it to say, is going here's nowhere. the solution. And well, it's eight o'clock, so I can't, <laughs> I can't ask you another question. But the reality is, is that it is here to stay. This is the future. And it is now. Most You've got to, if, you, if you miss out on this boat, then uh, you could be You've missing really out on out. one big profitable boat that you could make your fortune off. All right. Well, I think I'm going to go and take a look at this. And perhaps, I know it might be uh, a little bit late, but maybe I can become a millionaire soon. And then I can, <laughs> I can run away and become a, a Bitcoin specialist. Mpo Degada, uh, sharing his personal experience about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Thank you so much for talking to us. All right. Let's, uh, let's get our news. at.